The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. You can earn continuing education credits through ACI's online CEU program. Visit www.concrete.org to register. ACI conventions provide an opportunity for networking and for keeping up to date with the latest in concrete technology and practices. At this time, I'd like to introduce Larry Tabor, who is a professional engineer, structural engineer with um, Black & Veatch. Thanks, Kim. Okay, uh, quickly, just about me. I don't get hung up on it, but uh, I have a bachelor's and a master's from Rolla, University of Missouri, Rolla. Um, I've done a ton of holes. I've climbed in a lot of nasty places, a lot of high-rise places, towers, spillway gates, dams, things you got to use ropes for, so um, a lot of fun stuff. Uh, I'm way too busy on international committees. I currently am uh, involved with the Kansas chapter and I am a past president of the Missouri chapter. So what are we going to talk about today? Uh, mine's kind of the broad topic, if you want to call it that. And so I'm trying to get you guys into the, into the session. You know, you guys, we have field investigations. We have uh, evaluating various structures. What do we want to do? Well, first I got to talk about a few basics and then of course you got to talk safety. And, you know, most presentations um, start kind of chronologically, if you want to call it that. Prepar the uh, preparation of the office is your first step, and it's probably your most important step. So we're going to talk about that. What do you want to put in your equipment bag? Obviously, you don't want to show up to site with your bare hands and say, yep, yeah, we're good. Proving your access, sometimes make a few little minor tweaks, whatever, uh, can really help you. Pictures and video tips and tricks. I, I've taken a lot of pictures and videos, and I've hopefully picked up one or two things along the way. And uh, you know, keeping your investigation organized. That, that will save you a bunch of heartache later. Occasionally you need to document your findings. Most of the time you're not being hired just to walk out and look at the site. Most of the time you need to write a report, write a memo, write a, a you know, design drawing, something. Normally you have an end goal in mind and you got to know what that end goal is. And of course working with others on sites. You can be the, you can be the biggest meanie or you can be a really nice guy and I guarantee you I know which way is going to get you more, more, uh, more access and better things. So quick, an introduction. It is a pretty broad topic. This is a topic that uh, you could talk probably a full day session on if you wanted to. It's just we don't have a full day. So presentation gives my, my view of it. It is my view. Uh, it is open enough that others have different views and do, they do things differently and that's okay. Everybody has to find their own niche. I'm, I'm here to show you what my niche is and hopefully you guys uh, either pick up on a few tips and tricks that I've got or if not, uh, at least some, some general uh, thoughts. If you're a well-seasoned uh, field guy, you've been out of the office quite a bit, you got a good suntan going, you know, perhaps uh, you might still pick up a few things. If you're new to getting out, hopefully you're going to be uh, getting a lot out of this presentation. It does cover existing structures. That was my focus is, okay, I've got a structure already built and I'm going out to look at it. However, a lot of the techniques and, and tricks uh, do roll over into inspecting existing construction or ongoing construction, I should say. So some field investigation basics. So who likes to get out of the office every now and then? You know, say it's, it's early, I know, but you know, I wake you up. So uh, understand that freedom doesn't come free. Um, you do get you do get unchained from your desk a little bit, but there are usually uh, catches. Number one, you can go to some really great places, but you can go to some really bad places. First of all, that's that's one of the big things. Other thing is that third bullet point: time constraints, budget constraints and other factors, um, your stress levels can go through the roof. I, I can't tell you, I, I could probably count on one hand the number of times I've had what I felt was plenty of budget, plenty of time to plan it, and all this stuff. Normally, they don't fully appreciate the prep time. Uh, whoever's developing the budget is they. Uh, don't full, fully appreciate the prep time, or they look at this as a marketing strategy thing, so we're just going to take one for the team, do this, and then do that. And, 
Um, your travel time is important. You got to account for all these things. So you want to be aware of that. The other thing, make sure you bring your problem solving skills. Most of the time you're a detective, you're investigating a problem. You walk in, you know, any idiot can say cracked, it's cracked. You know, any idiot can say that. You need to know why it cracked. And the why may be, well, okay, the shape, the type, the location of the crack, but it also may be when you start asking questions of, well, what happened? You know, uh, there's times where uh, somebody operated something, somebody forgot to close a valve, and usually there's clues. Case in point, I was uh, down in Texas one time and couldn't figure out why these walls are cracked, but then I saw a water stain about four feet up on the wall. What happened? Somebody shut a valve they shouldn't have shut. It was at a water plant. Uh, gallery flooded, cracked the walls. Um, it was never designed for that. Shouldn't have happened. It happened. And, but that, that watermark was a big clue. So you got to be looking out for these kind of things. Um, the other thing is young, old, whatever, we all have limitations. You have to recognize, accept those limitations and work within them. Nothing is worse than you coming out, making a statement or making a conclusion that is absolutely wrong that then gets the client or the owner in trouble, worse trouble than they started out in, and then now they're mad at you. So accept your limitations. We all have them, I have them, and if I don't know enough about the subject or I'm not sure, I make sure to state that clearly. Uh, it's not a fault of yourself or anything, it just is. Um, also, make sure to understand 90% of the time, maybe not on a construction site, but at least on existing sites where you have the construction, you are the focus. The operator is there every day. You got a, a wastewater plant, the operator is there doing their business every day. You got some weird guy showing up with the white hat and safety glasses looking a little too clean. Uh, that's that, that guy's going to get the attention. Uh, you need to act appropriately. Make sure you conduct yourself professionally. Don't, don't, uh, don't ever forget you usually are the focus of attention, especially if you're climbing or doing something like that. I do some industrial rope access sometimes, and when you're climbing down on a rope, everybody's watching you. I mean, it just is. So safety, it is probably the most critical thing. Uh, who wants to go home at night? You know, I want to go home at night. Those of you who didn't raise your hand, we need to talk. Uh, but uh, that safety is important. Um, it, it's no longer the, okay, I'm going to cowboy it, I'm going to go off here and just do this thing. Um, being reckless and unsafe isn't cool anymore. It used to be cool. Now companies understand liabilities, they understand your personal safety, and it's not cool. So be safe, think about it. Proper uh, personal protective equipment, PPE, is important. Um, the additional thing I would say as a, as a tip, make sure you understand what your site requires. Quite often, to be blunt, you'll show up on a site, and a lot of, a lot of the uh, places there, the people, they're not wearing their hard hats, and they're not wearing safety vests, is nothing, okay? That's kind of the status quo that they've, the routine that they fell in. That's fine. Uh, think of two different things. One, what does your company say? What are your company policies? Most companies have policies. And two, what are the local site things? Sometimes they're more stringent, sometimes they're not. In my case here, I go to a lot of hydropower sites where safety is very stringent. Um, I mean, you're backing into your site, you're putting a cone down, safety high-vis vest, all that business but I need to call ahead, and, or at least know anyways, of what the local restrictions are so I don't show up without a safety vest. Case in point this summer, I was out on a site in January, uh, everything was fine, I came back, and they had changed the rules. They had, now you're required to have long sleeve shirts. It's 98 degrees in the middle of Kansas City and it's hot. I, I'm just in short sleeve shirt. You know? um, they looked at that and said, oh boy, you got something you can put on? They had changed the rules. I didn't know that because I had just been on the site. I had already gone through their annual refresher training in January, but they changed rules midstream. So they were okay with that because it was a unique situation because of the timing. But in general, I should have probably called. Uh, get the training you need first. Make sure you don't go out somewhere and do something you were not trained for. Uh, lead awareness is a common one that's uh, often missed, but confined spaces, working at heights, those kind of things. Make sure you're fully trained. Again, fall protection, safety equipment. Don't be a fool. It's, it's not worth it, it's just not. Checklists and permit, this kind of goes along with safety. So you got pre-planned checklists, uh, they're an important uh, safety and planning tool, honestly. Uh, a pre-planned checklist goes by many, many names, there's many different people that call that, I'm just kind of calling it what I generally know it as or what I've seen it often as. One thing it includes usually is a job hazard analysis, it's also a risk analysis, uh, uh, performance analysis, I've seen it many different ways. But basically, what you're doing is you're thinking through the inspection and the steps ahead of time. You want to make sure that you're not forgetting something. Uh, if, if, if I'm on a job site and the buddy next to me, he collapses of a heart attack, right? 
I don't want to have to be saying, gee, where, where do I go to get the ambulance? You know, I need to know. Because quite often on job sites, 911, like sites that I'm at, 911 doesn't work. I'm out in the woods somewhere where I barely have a cell signal. I need to know that the nearest phone is at the head house of the dam and I got to dial the operator and then they got their own response team that comes in because life flight's an hour and a half away. Um, I got to know that. That's what that's for. Mm -hmm. So it helps you identify your hazards. It helps you promote good communication. You get the rescue team. Everybody's on the same plan. This should be going, first of all, you should have a pre-plan checklist and then the JHA needs to be reviewed the morning of your inspection before you start it. Sometimes known as a tailboard. Uh, pre-meetings, uh, toolbox talks, there's there's all sorts of names for them. And of course it also identifies gaps in knowledge. Quite often you're having a gap and like, well, what's the uh, what's the alarm of a plan? What's the alarm of the site? Well, I don't know, you know, loud bell. You know, that's what you write down. Well, maybe it's not a loud bell. Maybe maybe some alarm goes, you know, off a different way. Or there's two loud bells. There's a, I've had that where one's a loud ding and the other one's a dung, you know, kind of thing. And one meant the ammonia tank was leaking, the other one meant something else. So you got to ask. Along with checklist permits, uh, access permits. I limit here the space, uh, rope access, confined space. Confined space is something you're going to run into fairly typically. One of the most abused things that I often see is people don't recognize what a confined space is. Um, or they don't understand there are two types of confined space, a permit required confined space and a non-permit required confined space, according to OSHA. Understanding company policies, like my company says, we don't care what OSHA says, all confined spaces are permit required confined spaces. You will fill out one of those for every space you go in. Uh, confined spaces generally are those that are not normally meant for human occupancy. Uh, tanks, vaults, um, uh, even a spillway gate. I mean, a spillway gate's not confined, it's very open, the air's blowing right through. It's not a, the hazard is not in, in the air and the ventilation, it is in the fact that if I collapse and die of a heart attack down there, they're going to have a trouble getting me out. Um, that's that's the effort. So you definitely do not want to jump into a hole. Confined spaces definitely require training, but make sure that you uh, identify your issues, fill out your permits, don't forget the permits. Um, I know it's paperwork, I know it's a pain, especially when you're in trouble. That's going to save you. It'll save your life. Um, in terms of lockout tagout, that's another common one. Uh, the story with lockout tagout is you need to plan ahead. Nothing is worse. Nothing will kill your inspection or investigation worse than you show up and you mean to get in that basin because you got to investigate, right? Oh, well, the operator didn't know you were coming. He can't take that basin out of service. Um, be it, like I said, let's say a wastewater plant. Wastewater plants, you know, they can only shut the plant down for X number of hours before uh, nasty things start backing up in other places we don't want them to go. Um, water plants, same thing. Eventually somebody gets thirsty. So you have to plan ahead. Um, that's part of the pre-plan checklist, but it's also usually a lockout tagout procedure and permits. Um, you want to understand both your procedures and your client's procedures though, because like my company strongly resists me putting a lock or a tag on my client's equipment. I have clients that will not let me put my lock or my tag on their equipment, but they have adequate procedures, very adequate. They sign onto it, they're the signatory authority, and then I sign onto a separate piece of paper that says, okay, this guy can't release it until I sign off this piece of paper. So you have to understand those kind of procedures. Uh, the lotto is designed to help keep you safe. Um, it is often overlooked, I will say. I, young and, and dumb, I, I climbed into a, a, a clear well, and it was only when I got down in the clear well, and I'm looking at the pipe, this big 84 inch diameter pipe, and I can see down, and that's where the water leaves the plant, but at the same time I see three pumps over here. <laughs> And I've started thinking, well, what happens if that pipe starts water flowing in, okay? Um, that thought probably should have crossed my head when I was still out of the, out of the hole. Um, it didn't. So at that point, I'm looking at the space size going, man, I'm swimming out of here if it, if it fills up, because it's going to fill up within a matter of seconds. It's just that small of a space. Um, think ahead of time. That's the key on that. And Lotto would have helped that. Uh, didn't hurt later on, about a, 20 minutes later, an alarm goes off up there, and the guy says, I don't worry about it. <laughs> I'm in the hole, so I'm worried about it. Uh, don't feel bad, bad about asking questions, you know, it's your safety, it's your life, it makes you look more professional, makes you look more educated as well, there's a benefit to that, but you want to make sure to ask questions, it's your life. Uh, don't forget to remove it though when you're done, because if you forget to remove it, that is a huge no-no. Preparation in the office, very successful investigations usually start in the office. Um, occasionally you get the call of, hey, I need you out here now, we got a problem. But normally you have at least some time to prepare in the office. So you want to gather drawings, pictures, previous reports, whatever's available. 
unfortunately, a lot of times your information is pretty skimpy, so they say, hey, go check a uh, basin out over here, and you got to gather in your head what you've usually seen or what you've heard about. Um, normally, though, the first question is, do you have any pictures? Uh, pictures, I find, for investigations, a lot of times give you more information than the drawings do. The drawings are great for when you're analyzing it or if we need to get scale and heights and things like that or dimensions. Uh, but pictures help give you an idea of access. They give you an idea of general condition. You can start formulating an, an idea of what the issue is in your head. So pictures are generally pretty good. Reports are even better. Uh, understand, though, reports, some are good, some are bad. Um, there's times where you're being brought in to essentially do another report because somebody else did a report that was worthless. Uh, first of all, you don't want to be that guy that does the one that's worthless. But um, at the same time, there's a reason why those are brought in. So don't forget to also search the web for pictures, Google, Google Images. Many times I couldn't get any pictures of dams or something like that. There's a lot of hikers out there that love to take pictures of dams. Google Images pops them up. I got them. I don't even need to get them from the client. Um, work with managers for realistic expectations of schedule and budget. If you look at something and says this is just not going to happen, at that point, start talking and saying, okay, is this a strategic pursuit? That's kind of a key phrase, uh, meaning we know we're going to lose money, or at least we're not going to make any money on this. However, the end goal is we want to get that next big project with either the same client on a different spot, or we want to get the rehab job, so we're going to essentially do the inspection for free, basically. That does happen, and that's perfectly fine. Just make sure the expectations are understood ahead of time. And you want to get the right group of people. You know, if, if, if you know nothing about instrumentation controls, as I don't, uh, I make sure I grab it, and the project has an aspect of that, yet I'm leading the project. Make sure to grab the INC guy. Make sure. Um, don't forget that pre-planned checklist, and make sure, you, again, you know the end goal. Are you doing this inspection or investigation just simply to write a report? The owner needs to have every 10 years, he needs to have somebody climb in the hole and give you an answer. Or does they know, do they know there's a problem and they want to know about it? Or is it uh, going to go to construction work, rehab? A lot of times you're going in, and before you can draw up rehab drawings, you need to find out what's wrong, right? Well, that's you, you focus your inspection differently, your investigation a little differently, uh, if you know what you're doing. Sometimes you want to do a basic analysis situation before uh, you get there. Case in point, like I had um, concrete that was all cracking, they sent me pictures, I look at it, and sometimes it's a two-second analysis. I looked at the picture and said, boy, that sure does look like ASR, okay? Um, I did a little digging, found they had repaired in the past, and, and, and sure enough, it was ASR, and I showed up the site with that already in mind. You don't necessarily want to come with a lot of preconceived notions, but at the same time, you want to not be caught blindside. You want to know where to start looking. So sometimes ahead of time is the best place to think about that. Make sure you gather equipment that you're definitely going to need, but also, depending upon your situation, perhaps start thinking about some that you may need. You know, don't go crazy. I mean, if you're, uh, if you're checking nothing but a, a steel structure, let's say, you probably don't need a concrete crack gauge. You know, reasonable stuff. Keep, be reasonable about it. Also think about weight and size and all that. Um, again, if you're driving, excuse me, uh, you just want to be aware of the shipping and things like that. There's time, time element involved in some items. Uh, my company, we store all of our uh, air meters for confined space entries in Georgia in an office in Georgia in a big warehouse. Well, you know, if I need to inspect something, I'm leaving tomorrow, I probably ought to need it three days ago to call the guy up so he can ship it to me or to the site. If I didn't think about that ahead of time, I don't have an air meter and I can't go in the hole. If uh, need to meet ahead of time, it's always good to, to make sure your logistics and your project work. You know, don't just talk about the project. Say, hey, when are we meeting at the airport? Hey, what flight are you taking? Um, are, are we driving? When are we leaving? Are we going to stop and eat here? Those kind of things matter because they'll mess up your trip. Communicate with your client and the site. Make sure that you have a point of contact. Make sure you know where you're going. Make sure you know what risk it is. I mean, often you get these big sprawling sites. You may show up to this area here and you start talking around and the guy's looking like you got two heads, right? That's because you should have been over here and talking to George over here. Um, address your issues. Your inspection bag, what do you want? Well, a few things can ruin inspection. Uh, if you show up at the job site, you don't have the right tools. So now you're trying to improvise, you've already started off on a bad foot. Or you show up with a tool that didn't work, uh, things like that. I will say this is one spot where experience does help. After you, after you mess up a few times, you really pick that up. Um, except you can combat that by thinking through it and over planning, showing up with too much equipment. You know, the, the, the old story of the hiker, that, the hiker that shows up with 60 pounds of gear, you got the experienced guy showing up with 20 pounds of gear. After the first day, that 60 pound of gear is probably down to 40, and by the third day, it's back down to 20 where the experienced guy's at. You know, you know you what you need to haul, what you don't want to haul. Make sure you have fresh batteries, equipment functioning. I've many times gotten caught by bad batteries. But if you're driving the site, uh, you can pack extra stuff. Cars can pack a lot of stuff. 
Uh, if you're not driving to a site though and you're flying, make sure you got limitations. A lot of airlines limit you to a bag of 50 pounds, right? Sometimes you can ship out equipment ahead of time. If it's a really big project or something or a big investigation, you can do that. Not always though. So sometimes I have, a, I have bags. The fairly lightweight bags are cheap. I know they're going to get busted every so often. Um, at the same time, I literally uh, can pick that bag up and walk out. And I know when I pick it up, I know if it's 50 pounds or less. I, I picked up enough of them. Uh, weighed enough of them, but I've gone to the scale, put myself on it, grabbed the bag, held it as well, and said, okay, yep, it's less than 50 pounds more. And I said, man, I need to stop eating. Um, but uh, you may have to get some items when you get there. Spray paint, that's one common thing. Yeah, mark an area that's bad, right? Oh, you're doing a sounding on concrete, you're beating away, you're here these hollow spots, you got to mark that. Don't carry spray paint on a plane. So there's always a hardware store, there's always a Walmart, somewhere where you're going, pick it up when you get there. <clears throat> These are just some various items. I'm not going to read through them all, but uh, some of the uh, more common tools that I found in my um, in my inspection bag. I literally opened my inspection bag up and started digging through it and said, "What do I need?" Um, these are some of the things. You know, a couple things not to forget: water, snacks. You know, take care of your body. Sometimes inspections, you're you're so focused on the project and just so worried about that, and all of a sudden you realize I haven't drank anything all day. I haven't gone to the bathroom all day. You know, think about your body as well. You, you're going to be number one more effective. You're going to be clearer, thinker. But uh, at the same time, um, especially on big projects for multiple days, you don't want to get too worn out. Uh, quality flashlight, you know, I've had a lot of junky flashlights, but um, I found a good flashlight. Even if you're on a job site that you're in the middle of the daylight, invariably there's some nook and cranny that you're trying to dig into that you're going to whip that flashlight out. Crack gauges, uh, a lot of the uh, uh, vendors and people like that, they make crack gauges, which is basically a clear thing with a bunch of lines on them, uh, black lines, as you're looking at it. Uh, you can set it on over top of a crack and figure out how wide the crack is. Um, you know, ask vendors. Most of them have them. I know CTL at one point made them. Uh, I thought getting any names. PPE. Don't forget again, all your PPE. Uh, inspection mirrors help for seeing around corners. Uh, your camera. Camera's an important tool. I got that in a second here. Um, proving your access. Some of these sites, just tough to get to. I, I'm not going to lie. There's some sites you just can't get to. I mean, it's just not going to happen short of longer, bigger prep, building scaffolding, something. Uh, you need to recognize that and make sure that the expectations are understood. There are times where you just can't get to something short of doing it. Um, case in point, we have clear wells, right? Reservoirs, after you make nice clean water, um, you put them in this, in this concrete tank. Well, a lot of times the owner's interested in the roof. Sometimes the best way to inspect the underside of a roof is to get in a boat and float the reservoir. You literally, you take a boat that sticks through the hole, you blow it up, have to disinfect everything, and then you're paddling around the reservoir five feet from the ceiling because that's the easiest way to get up there. If the reservoir was empty, it'd be 40 feet from the ceiling or 30 feet. So think about your access. Think about the best way to get there. Get creative. Sometimes getting creative, but be safe. Um, sometimes using site pictures helps you figure out your problems and you can plan ahead. Other times you kind of get on site and just jiggle it around. Um, ladders. Ladders can help. I do have some clients that flat don't want me to use their ladders. It's a liability thing. They say, nope, can't use them. There's other ones that say, sure, I'll, you need me to move over there, no problem. I can do that. And you just got to understand that difference. There is a difference there. Uh, some clients are uh, very hands-off, some are very hands-on. Sometimes some of them will send you a minder, but I call a minder. Basically, one of the operators that is assigned to be five feet from you all day. If he needs anything, if I need, you know, whatever, get him that stuff. That's what he's told. Uh, others, you're wandering around the site yourself. You're thinking, geez, I, I could flip any one of these valves here. It probably cause a problem. <laughs> you know, again, behave. Uh, boom list, great when available. Uh, think about your cost. If you've got a week-long job and you can knock that down to a three-day job, you can save two days, you just pay for your boom cost. So think about that. Understand, sometimes you only need to get to a, a, a uh, you, you don't necessarily need to physically get there. You just need to see it, get eyes on the prize. Well, one way to get eyes on the prize is a mirror. Take a mirror and flashlight flying behind, behind the hole, uh, or a camera, um, which this is my, uh, my one, well, I'll call it a pure trick. And I, I figured this one out on my own. I'm sure others have done the same thing, but uh, I, I don't know. I've never seen other, others do it. But, um, so I call this my camera on a stick trick. Basically, imagine, first of all, uh, you're, you're standing up at the top of an intake sh shaft or something where you're real high, and you can get to the bottom. But then if you need to see the underside of the roof, which is 50 feet up in a dark hole, if you stand there at the bottom and you take your camera and you click your camera, uh, you're not going to get the top. I'm, I'm here to tell you. But let's say there's an access hole at the top uh, where you can maybe stick your hand down in there and you're, you're getting your camera, right? And you're taking pictures. 
The easier way to do that is most cameras on the bottom side of the tripod mount is a quarter 20 thread, quarter inch uh, uh, bolt, standard coarse thread fits in that tripod. Go grab yourself a piece of all thread, go grab yourself a nut or a, a bolt, cut off the head, get yourself a hose clamp and uh, screw that up into the bottom, mount it using a screwdriver, mount it to uh, a, anything, handy, pole, anything. Uh, broomsticks, shovels, pieces of rebar, I, I've used them all. Um, and basically you uh, do that and then you can set your auto timer, set your auto flash, stick it in the hole. It usually takes pretty good pictures. Sometimes it takes a little time to get the orientation right. A lot of times the picture's upside down, but it's digital, you can rotate it. This is uh, just a quick view of uh, what I just took it from my cameras and did the same thing, but you can just see that there's, you know, hose clamp, piece of thread, just attached to a piece of rebar, nothing, nothing too complex. So picture taking tips. Your camera is probably your most valuable tool, honestly. Number one, it helps your documentation. Number two, it saves you from writing notes. I don't take a lot of notes when I'm on site. I find the paper's usually kind of messy, it gets wrinkled, everything like that. And I want my hands free. I can walk around taking my camera and then shortly after, uh, which we'll get to in a second, but shortly after document that. Um, so it's good for documentation as well. Make sure though, what I see too many times, I ask the guy that's local on site, send me some pictures, okay? And let's say there's a problem right here, right? He's here. He's taking a picture, click, sends me that picture. I'm going, great, where's that at? I don't, I don't have a clue, I have no context, okay? He needs to stand back here, take the picture, and then move in and take the picture. You don't want to um, just simply go right here because you lose the context. And it, as an engineer, when I'm trying to figure out why that crack happened, I need the context. Um, just a crack, it's a crack, okay? I can tell you it's a crack. Um, so make sure you get the big picture and the little picture. When you're doing repetitive things, one trick I found, uh, I do a lot of gate inspections, uh, spillway gates as well. They're, they're steel, not kind of clear, I know, but um, you know, you got gate one, gate two, gate three, gate four, whatever. Okay, there's also within a gate, there's a left side and a right side, and they all may matter. Well, after a while, everything starts looking the same. So before you move on to another gate, which we'll get to in a second, um, you want to stand here, and if I'm on the left side of gate two, I'll do this, and I'll take a picture of my hand like this. Okay, that tells me I'm left-handed. This is my left hand. I'm on the left side of gate two. Um, right hand of gate five would be five, you know, that kind of thing. So that helps you within your pictures to know where you're at. And if you maintain, in a second I'll get to maintaining a certain pattern, if you maintain the pattern, then you know that every picture following that was on the right-hand side of gate five or whatever. Um, autofocus and flash generally work well, but understand when they don't. Uh, there's times where the flash may not work well, so you want to turn it off. Landscape portrait. Uh, landscape pictures going like this versus like this. Landscape tends to work better uh, for reports. It just fits better, fits nicely across the screen. You're not taking up a whole page of your, uh, of your report. So if you can make it work, use landscape. If you're taking pictures of CN Tower, perhaps go portrait, okay? Uh, picture taking tips. How to uh, use your camera, practice. It may sound silly, but practice. Um, okay, uh, so I got I to gotta blow through this. So, um, short, easily, uh, red ruler, avoid oblique angles, um, that kind of stuff. Understand digital is free. Um, it, it's, it's free. Use it. So video documentation. Use your videos to supplement your pictures. That's the key. Um, you want to make sure that your videos are uh, clear. Watch what you say. If I had to pick one item out of here, which I do, be careful what you say of the video. Just the facts. Just the facts, man. Or say nothing. Uh, lawyers love videos. Um, make sure to keep your investigation organized. Walk in a specific path. Pick a pattern. Don't think about, okay, I got to go from here to here, so I'm going to wander random around, or you know, wander around randomly. Okay, don't do that. Go here to here. Be very disciplined, and clean up your notes shortly after. Your memory fades. Everybody's does. You get on busy with other things. So also develop simple inspection forms that are flexible but fit with the thing. This happens to be one. It's in your notes handouts. Um, this happens to be one, I know you can't read it there, but basically it has an overall condition assessment, the digital names, and then specific problems. But it's flexible enough that I can work through it. And then you definitely want to document your findings because, frankly, your best field work, it's junk if you don't document it right. I mean, you, you know the answer, but nobody else does. So make sure you understand your audience and, uh, you know, be careful and confident when reporting your thing. Make sure that you're not saying something you shouldn't say, but be confident about it. Don't, I mean, if you understand and you know it, say it. Uh, at the same time, be careful. So uh, make sure you work with others on site. A good attitude, check a bad attitude at the door. Don't, don't show up at a bad attitude. You will, you will have more problems on a site and turn more operators off. If you start looking down on them, if you start just being a mean guy and acting like you know everything, just understand that. 
So be careful uh, what you're saying as well. That operator seems to remember what you say, but he usually doesn't see the report. So two years later, you should back up the site and say, yeah, we had some engineer here, and he said that this was this. You know, well, maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. Make sure you watch what you say. So uh, communication, like I said, before you get on site, while you're on site, during your investigation, make sure everybody's aware of this stuff. Uh, hold a wrap-up meeting before you leave site. Number one, it lets people know that you're done and you're leaving site, so they're not still looking for you. But number two, uh, it gives them some general feelings and some expectations for when you're going to have that report done, when you're going to have it done. Uh, you can set that expectation early. And then during the documentation phase, if you have questions or problems, you know, that's what you need to do. So in general, things can be fun. It's hard work. Uh, be safe. That's the main thing. Think about your tool bag. Think about what tools you get in there. Um, good pictures, 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 pictures. Uh, keep your investigation organized and efficient so you don't miss something huge. And then uh, make sure to keep a good attitude. That's the thing. It's, it's a fun job. It's fun to get out of the office every once in a while, but you can go bad. So I don't think we have any time for any quick questions, but thank you.